Okay. Share, copy, link. Let's see if this works. So yeah, I reset um, the computer. I reset the settings on Chrome. I reset the microphone and brought it back on. And then I reset the background settings on the MacBook and none, and none of those things affected YouTube in any way whatsoever. So um, I'll go long on this to make up for five minutes of dead time because I'm incompetent at YouTube evidently. Um, okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, it works, but no chat on the other stream. What? I'm watching a chat on this stream. Okay. If anybody's in the old chat, give them that same link and send them back over here. Wow. I can't believe we got back up to over a hundred people again so quickly. Well done. Let me pop this chat out to the side so it makes it easier for me to watch. Uh, so what happened was there's a port on my Mac that evidently just quit working because I plugged my power into it and it's also not charging. Uh, and that was the one that I had my microphone plugged into. So what are you going to do? It's either that or I unplug the camera, which seems like a bad idea. <laughs> but evidently, if you change um, audio in the middle of a live stream and you're not doing their like use third party software to stream, I'm just doing the webcam version. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys, for coming and following over here. Sorry. Um, let's see. <sighs> the algorithm gods. Okay. Yeah, it is time for another flight, by the way. Mm. My total eclipse pour is whatever whiskey I have in my hand when it gets to that moment. All right. So that is Brooklady. Now we're going to move to America. Next place it really starts to show up is the early American whiskey. It was not bourbon, it was rye and uh, Monongahela rye, to be specific. And so I. I'm going to um, pour Dad's Hat Rye because I think Dad's Hat is awesome. And I love the owner, who's just a cool human. And it's a really great um, Pennsylvania rye. So there, fight me. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, and yes, that, that's the state flag that's behind me covering, partially covering up, um, my garage door. Uh, I can get dad's hat in Texas. I've bought it at the local store, uh, it, but very, you don't get all of them. Like they have one, uh, like the one we're drinking right now, which is the lower proof. Is that the 90? Yeah, this is the 90. So the 45%. Hmm. Yeah. Team Rye. Boo! <laughs> um, mm. Spicy. Yeah. You know what? I should wear a hat while we're drinking Dad's hat. Watch. If I get up again and it goes off, it's your guys' fault. All right. Summer hat. This is my It's Summer in Texas hat. And you can tell it's last year's hat because it's already broken. This is what I wear to keep the keep skin cancer <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, trying to human uh, dad's hat rye, Breckenridge. Oh, Breckenridge PX. That's a good one. Uh, they're sourcing and then finishing, I think, right? Breckenridge? I don't think they're making their own. Could be wrong about that. Um, dad's hat is not a new distillery. They are, I would argue one of the older Pennsylvania craft distilleries. Um, and I mean like in the last 10 years, like that, which in craft, like guys were only like 20 years old. So this is what we have. Um, SMWS picks Alexander written, uh, got good questions tonight, Alexander. Um, 
my favorite one recently, I just put back earlier today. And I don't remember what number it was, but it's called. Is it shotgun whirly gig? No, it is. <laughs> Nick knack woody whack. <laughs> Cause SMWS is so good at that. Um, my favorite Canadian whiskey right now is probably a shelter point followed by why my, my ultimate favorite is JP Weiser dissertation. And that was a question that was asked from Persepolis and, um, my favorite craft is, is going to be between Glen Breton or Glen Oro distillery and, uh, or Cape Breton, Glen Oro distillery and probably shelter point. And then, uh, but man, the JP Weiser's, the stuff that they get that we never get to touch is actually absolutely lovely. Am I ever going to play a crowded barrel? Probably no. Um, just it's time. I don't play a lot of live shows uh, these days, but you know, I'm not against it. I'm just, it's not to do with where I'm playing. Crowd Barrel, no, I'm never going to play there. It's to do with like, am I going to play live anytime soon in Austin? And I think the answer is probably not anytime soon. Um, uh, Brian Dormandy asked, am I going to be repping the vault during the Bastards Ball? And the answer is, I would like to, yes. Um, but I have no idea what their plans are for Bastards Ball this year. And what I want to make sure that we're not doing at the tower is creating any kind of activity that sucks human beings away from what they're trying to accomplish on their side. And so we're going to wait until they have a plan. And if they think having access to the tower is helpful for their day to have activities, then yes, absolutely. I'll probably even be giving tours. If they think that they would rather make sure all attention is focused on their side of the property I'm, I'm fine with that too. And uh, no, I'm not typically at Crowded Barrel on Fridays or even on campus on Fridays these days. I'm either traveling to get to my human or I've got my boys and we're doing family things. Uh, this material, I think, is just, um, what do you call it? Um, not wicker. Come on, there's a name for this. It's just that like, like threaded uh, straw, straw. It's just a straw hat. Um, but it is a uh, genuine Panama hat, which took me a long time to realize it's made in Ecuador. <laughs> and that's actually real. That's not like, because this is a knockoff. Panama hats come from Ecuador. Okay. We're about to go on from rye to bourbon, and I chose an easy drinking wheat forward Solera cask, big brand, Blade and Bow. So, okay. <laughs> Read. When am I going to go to Tampa where that hat fits? Only to see you, my friend. It's the only reason that I have to go to Florida or to Tampa anyway. Mm. All right, so I'm taking sips and then setting them down. And if you're drinking through six whiskeys, you should be doing the same thing. Um, or at least going gently. All right, and the hat. That was a nice little toss. I wish you guys could have seen that. Made me feel like a pro. Oh, man. Now I've got to open it. There we go. I always forget that's their trick. Okay. Keep an eye on my battery so we don't lose the laptop now instead of the, the phone. Um, or I mean, instead of the microphone. Okay. I like Blade and Bow. It's a soft, kind of gentle approach to bourbon, and I'm a fan of it. Um, they do Solera cask, they say, and it's just so well, you know. They do Solera cask. And what I've always wondered, and I've never had anybody answer this question, was how do you Solera cask bourbon? and still call it bourbon because that's a TTB regulation question for me. If you take bourbon from a new oak barrel and move it into another barrel, that's not new oak. 
That's a no longer bourbon, according to TTB. That's a distilled spirit specialty. That's a finish, a bourbon barrel finish. However, I do know of people like recasking leaky barrels and, and there's some gray wiggle room for that. And so I think they're playing in the gray area. Um, but they're calling it bourbon, just straight bourbon, right? But it's okay. In case you don't know, the Solera method is you take young whiskey and you put new make, you put it in, it gets to uh, five years old, six years old, and then you're going to bottle a six year old bourbon. So you pull whiskey out of it, but you don't pull all of it. You pull like a third or half out of it and you leave six year old whiskey half in those barrels. In the meantime, in the last five years, you've been filling a whole new round of barrels every year. And so as you empty part of that bottom row, you fill it with five-year-old whiskey and then halfway, and then you fill the five-year-old half with four-year-old and you just keep moving through. So that bottom row gets older and older, but is always mixed with the most recent stuff. So there's always, you know, young five-year-old whiskey. And then over decades, there's 40-year-old molecules in that whiskey. And that's called Solera Cascade, comes out of the wine industry. Um, I would love to see somebody who knows... Um, how they figured that out with TTB or do they just not explain it? And TTB just assumes their label's correct. Oh, okay. Well, what's this? A quick answer? Mark says he has an answer here. As long as the barrel you're putting it into is also a charred oak barrel. Right. It already has bourbon in it. Okay. You're not putting it into something that's different than what it was in before. Okay, so they're considering that to just be like yeah. consolidating barrels it would be almost. No than if you had a, a damaged barrel and you were Okay. It. So he's saying that because the product you're moving it from and into is the same exact product and the origin of both products is new oak, that it's no different than MGP consolidating leaky barrels into one barrel of the same product and it doesn't change its category. Um so that's it's not a used barrel. Yeah, Freak Mac is correct. It's not a used barrel at that point. You're just topping up the bourbon, basically. Okay. Yeah, Hill Rock is also Solera. Kylie Rutledge. I'm new to whiskey. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lying about it has been an option in the past. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Like stuff that can start a conversation. Um, what other countries whiskey would you recommend? Other than the big five, Australia. Just doing some really cool stuff. Okay. Sweet. Let's see. Do you require W set to become a sommelier? J Joseph Sirkinov. No. Um, and that's because, and I'm a W set too in spirits. Um, the W set system is totally different than what we're teaching uh, when it comes to tasting and analyzing and sensory development. And while it's very helpful for broad knowledge, it doesn't gain you anything directly one-to-one -one for the Whiskey Somalia program. Great program if you're into that sort of thing. And it does a great job of good, broad categorical knowledge. I have fundamental disagreements with WSET on how they force you to describe tasting notes. But they're not moral problems. They're just like the kind of problem you would sit on the table on a deck and argue with your friends about for hours if you're our kind of nerd. Um, I just, I don't. For example, one small thing, I'll give you an example. One small thing is uh, they won't let you describe whiskey as sweet. You'll get marked down if you describe whiskey as sweet. Why? Because in the W set world, sweet means sugar added. And if sugar's not added, then you can't, in a W set tasting guide, call it sweet. You can call it other things, you know, vanilla or cream. You can hint at sweet, but you can't use the word sweet or you get graded down. Ola from England. Adam Croft. I don't know if you understand that Ola is not from England. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next Psalm 1 class is, I think, in June or July. 
Oh, I don't remember. It's this summer. The next, I think it's June. Okay. What's next in whiskey? I was asked this question, Michael Redman. I was asked this question earlier by a magazine interview. Um, and it, I think American single malt and blending, real blending, not blending, not being a dirty word, uh, whiskey blending. That's the future of North American whiskey for the next five to 10 years, American single malt and blending. And I would also like to argue, um, independent bottling, but that's my own pet project. So, um, and. Oh, and good good question. George L., do you think that the new approval of American single malt when it happens will cause people to only use ex-bourbon exclusively? No, absolutely not. I think it's going to mirror Scotland, where it's going to be dominantly bourbon, followed by sherry and European oak, and then followed by other interesting things. Okay. Do I have... Oh, yes, Joseph Sirkonov. Uh, do you have Dagen, Davin de Kergamo's new book? Yes, I do. And it's beautiful. And uh, I think you guys should all, if you really want to know Canadian whiskey, you should all be looking into Davin de Kergamo's new book. He's a great author and a good good guy. Um, okay, I love it. Home blending is great. Yeah, berries. Oh, that's a great reference. M. Shardy 5. Berries aren't sweet. They're blushing ripe. Yeah, it does make you start to get creative with your tasting notes. Um, and no, I'm not going to tell you anytime soon, although this summer we will. Actually, that may be not true. This summer we're going to Estes Park, my family. So maybe um, we'll stop by. Um, other uh, chain stores on the Marriott still hard to find. Yeah, but it won't be once there's news that it's got its own category. I guarantee you there's going to be a bigger move to retail to make sure that they have an American single malt section for a little while. And then the, the novelty will wear off and it'll put it. Um, come on. What have we got? Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Reed's right. So my friend Mark is texting Reed who's in the chat because we're all nerds. No, Reed is texting. Yeah. Me. Yeah. No, Cause he heard you. Your, your voice carries. This is a high, this is a, it picks up a lot. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, what distillery do you think poor man's blends? Uh, yeah. Oh, Game Bear. You got married in Estes? Nice. I must have taken a lot of preparation with like park passes and, oh, probably not in the park. Probably just in Estes, I'm guessing, which would probably be easier. Um, uh, Evan Pearson, when is that whole TTB American single malt thing going to become official? Man. If we had a nickel for every time we got asked that question, I have no idea. No one knows. And anybody who says they know is lying to you, including TTB people. <laughs> um, how would IBs be different in the U.S. as Anthony James? Um, yeah, no, it wouldn't be different. So what my goal is with independent bottling in North America is that we create a category that more closely mirrors Scotland and Ireland's independent bottling instead of what America has become, which is undisclosed, sourced, white-labeled whiskey brands. And I built an entire website with Adam and Nora from Lost Lantern. This is what we believe right there. I wonder if I need to put the link. Let's see. Uh, AmericanIndie.com. See if this shows up as a link. There you go. Now it shows up as a link. Um, yeah, we built a whole website to say this is what we believe American independent bottling and blending is. And if you know of anybody who should be on those lists, fill out the form on the website. We'll get them added. I found out there's another independent bottler today that I'd never heard of, and I did a screenshot of it, but I don't have my phone. But they should be added. Um, I'm not going to do a whiskey vault flavor wheel because there's already so many good flavor wheels out there. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. <laughs> not even a chuckle from off camera. Mark's distracted. Okay. <laughs> Have I had Balcona's Trace Amigos? This was asked multiple times. Oh, Space Knight's trying to make sure it pops up again. Um, yes. And I really like it. It's unique. It's not my go-to. I prefer a lot of other Balconos first, but I like it. Okay. 
Okay, we are moving on now. Oh, what are we moving on to? I have two more over here and I can't remember why. Oh, Canada. I, I, I wanted to get a Canadian that people could try. And so I just grabbed Alberta Premium. I actually prefer, like they used to do one called Dark Rye and then they quit releasing it. And they also used to do one called Dark Horse, I think was in the, but it was the Canada versus America release. Love that one. If you can get your hands on it. It's real Canadian rye. Um, and, but you know, this is a budget one, but at least it's rye. Actual rye and not just rye in name only. Um, have I, Stephen Jominar, man, I hope I pronounced that right. Are you becoming accustomed to cast strength, high proof whiskey? How can you adjust your palate to enjoy lower proof? I prefer lower proof. I do not prefer cask strength. I just, I really don't. I like that it carries more flavors and yes, that's nice, but my sweet spot is a hundred. That's my favorite, somewhere around a hundred proof. Um, I tend to add a lot of water when it gets too hot. I'll try it first, but then if I'm going to really just sit and enjoy something, I'm going to add water to it. Um, Lot 40 is a great brand. That one you guys should try too. Uh, why Texas for a location for making whiskey? Who is that? Uh, the Jews? Yeah, that's what it's spelled. Are you representing your all of your people? Can you do? Yeah, you know, it's an uh, just <laughs> Brooklady. <laughs> Paul Nimmons. All right. Uh, what was the question? Why Texas? Because I lived here, and I think Texas makes great whiskey. Mm, Fuente, yeah. Ooh, yeah, there's your column still right there. That is paper thin, baby. Is there a specific mash bill that's easier for Queen's runs? Uh, I don't know. I've only done Queen's runs on bourbon mash bills uh, with weeded as the accent grain and malt. And they were both equally complicated or not complicated so i don't know that oh queen's runs game bear okay so you do a pot distillation you have the heads you siphon them off you keep the hearts that's the second part and then when it starts getting the flavors you don't like you switch it back and you collect the feints or the tails you take the heads and tails you put them together typically those get added in to the next distillation run to fill up and sort of like get everything you can out of those sometimes people will take the feints the tails and the heads move them together, proof them down, and run them by themselves and do a new heart cut. It's almost a triple distillation. And uh, and it's weird, and they're a little bit more funky. And so you can either take that and age it separately and release it, and you get a really unique version, or you can take it and use it as a blending component to bring things out when you're creating a release. Favorite Taiwanese whiskey, I used to say Kavalon because, I mean, they're just gorgeous whiskey. But then I had this one Omar whiskey that I think changed my life. And I now think I like I think Omar is state sponsored, but I, I just gorgeous whiskey. But generically, Kavalon is probably my go to. Um, does head have methanol in it? Technically, if you ran a, a chemical analysis, it would have traces of methanol in it. But you can't distill methanol on a pot still. That's just, it doesn't work. Okay, where are we at? 7.45. Okay, good. We're working down. What would be a great whiskey to sip on election night? Man, that's a terrible... I mean, anything that makes you forget to turn the TV on <laughs> and then just go to sleep and then wake up the next day and we'll just figure it out because that's what we've always done. And that's who we are. All right. Uh, chill filtration. Anthony James asks, nah. I mean, I would argue generically I'm not a fan because it strips flavor components out of it. But I have had really amazing whiskey that I love that's chill fil filtered. So... Meh. I don't know that I have a strong opinion on it anymore. Um, I don't know of anybody doing a Queen's Run release that's not baby craft distillery. And I haven't had even a baby craft distillery do an only Queen's Run release that I know of. 
So. Oh, yeah. You know what I ever – oh, the hardest whiskey to pour from without leaking whiskey onto the table is Sexton. That Sexton bottle is bullshit. You cannot pour that bottle without it dribbling whiskey all over the place. It's not possible. It's never been done in the history of pouring Sexton whiskey. <laughs> uh, Levix, my honest opinion on Naked Grouse whiskey is that I like it. It's got a kind of a smoky note to it. I, it's my favorite of the famous grouse type line. Um, let's see. Oh, and someone said Devil's River, River Chill Filters. And I think that was uh, Whiskey Shaman. Yeah, they do. And I, what I've always, I've talked to Mike about this. What I've always wanted to do is be like, Mike, let me have a barrel of the Unchill Filtered and then a single barrel run through your chill filtering process that we've already decided tastes the same or do a blend of two barrels and then split it in half and chill filter half of it. So it's the exact same product in every way, except for that chill filtering. I think that would be a really amazing, interesting science nerdy experiment. Um, but Mike's a little busy these days. I don't know if you've noticed he's been hanging out with some movie stars. So I might not be able to get him to answer my calls anymore. <laughs> he's too busy getting ready, practicing for his role in the next uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> okay. Um, I would love to see other distilleries documenting their process on YouTube. I think we all benefit from more education. I think we um, benefit from more distilleries being open about their processes and sharing it and bringing more people along the journey. I hope everyone starts doing that. Okay. Yes, I could absolutely see mineral water in the famous in the naked grouse release. Absolutely. Like a petrichor, sort of like a asphalty rain note. Okay. Uh Eric, wait, asked a question, evidently. How did I miss that? Oh, triple distillation versus tall stills and high reflux. How would you describe the differences in the spirit? Not in a way that would be helpful to a whiskey drinker. So that's the answer. Uh, so I like your example perfectly because Glenn Morangy, is it Glenn Morangy that has the really super tall? I think you said that. Yeah. And then Akintoshin is triple distilled, but pot still. And I think Akintoshin is meatier and heftier and waxier than Glenn Morangy. And so if I had been asked this question and was acting on instinct, my answer would be there's less of a low mids EQ range. Um, but I, if you compare Glenn Morangy and Akintoshin, that's not true. Akintoshin definitely has more low mids than Glenn Morangy. So there's a lot more going on there. And I would argue that you would never be able to pin it down to one single thing. It's like, why does, how does a barrel affect whiskey? Well, it's like, well, and if you change that one thing, does it, how does it change? You know, these guys age their bourbon in the top of the rickhouse. These guys age that bourbon in the bottom of the rickhouse. Yeah, but they also are in different climates. They also do longer fermentations. They also, there's so many other components that it's almost, we would really need a distillery to do like Glen Morangy, to do a triple distillation with their tall stills and Akintoshin to do a double with their stills. And then we could tell, but I don't know that you can really answer that as a one-to-one -one, and that's really depressing, but I think it's a, oh, I did ask Vic Cameron that question. Um, and he said, it depends. <laughs> but we were also really late in the whiskey night drinking session, so he may not remember. Okay. Okay, I'm moving on from Canada. Hey, you know what? Since I was dead in the water for minutes, um, I can extend this live stream by 10, 15 minutes, and that'll give me a seventh whiskey. <laughs> And I can pour American single malt, which I wanted to do in the first place anyway. But we are finishing the official list 
with Yoichi, which is the Nika distillery way the hell up north on the island. And, oh, my glass is right here. I love Yoichi. I think between Yoichi and Miyagikyo, I prefer Yoichi, but I also really like Miyagikyo. And I think the story behind why he started all of those different distilleries is really cool. Uh, Masataka Takatsuru really um, believed that to get diverse components when creating your blends, you needed your original distillation components to be produced and aged in totally different environments. And so he went all the way down, halfway down the island to open up Miyagikyo so he could have a distillery with a whole different profile. And Yoichi is way up north, and it's got that original kind of classic. And I, I think that's really exciting. I know these are the no-age statements, and a lot of people are annoyed by that, but um, I am not one of them. Oh, my my Japanese whiskey pronunciations. You know I have to thank for that is Brian, um, who has his own channel called Japanese Whiskey Reviews. I think the Japanese Whiskey Review. Go check him out. Uh, he's the one that I always email with my Japanese whiskey questions. Really cool guy. Okay. What would, other than oak, would I be excited to see someone use Teresa or Canadian Whiskey Smith? I don't know. I actually... I, I'm searching for the right answer, but all that's coming to mind is I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. I want people to do what they think is cool shit and then be like, here, try this. That's what I want. I want to try interesting things. However people get there, I don't actually care. I don't know enough about the varieties of wood. I was really excited about Method and Madness to get to try all these weird Irish whiskey aging finishes. So that was fun. But, but... It wasn't because I was like, I've been waiting for someone to do chestnut. It was just like, no, that sounds interesting. I would like to try that. Oh, Donald Rance just said it. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, somebody mentions Ralphie. If you're not watching Ralphie, you should watch Ralphie. Go watch Ralphie. Um... Oh, Malt Philistine asks, because we're starting to see Japanese whiskey age statements back again, does that mean the craze has passed? Uh, yeah, and they did it to themselves. This is a personal opinion. I would love to be proven wrong. I hope that Japanese whiskey, real Japanese whiskey, comes back with a vengeance. But because they had no rules and because they were uh, not honest about what they were doing, and that even includes Nika using Ben Nevis scotch in their blends and not telling anybody for a long time, they went from the most amazing thing in the world to we can't trust a thing coming out of that country. Boom. And the bottom fell out. And that's actually one of the reasons that uh, I helped found the Texas whiskey association is because I was worried that we were going to end up in the same situation with Texas whiskey. We we're going to have all these real guys doing real stuff, working their butts off to create a Texas whiskey category. And then we got all these Canadian whiskey companies and random uh, white labeled sourcing Kentucky and Canadian whiskey and putting a Texas flag on the front. And I, want, I wanted to do something about it. I didn't want us to become the next warning story in whiskey history. Okay. Ben Nevis is great, but I'm just saying it shouldn't be blended into a Japanese whiskey and then pretend to be Japanese. It's a cool blend. As a matter of fact, the real story is even cooler. A blend of scotch in Japan. I'd drink that, especially if I knew it was happening. I'd, I think that'd be great. Oh, yeah. Always means forever. They recently came up with standards for Japanese whiskey. But here's the thing. That is not government regulation. That is an industry group, just like the Texas Whiskey Association, a trade group that has is trying to lead by influence, but there's no legal requirement. And so we're not there yet. They haven't adopted it from the government. Mm. Okay. Well, so like my, one of my favorites ever was Nika from the barrel. And then I found out that it was basically just Ben Nevis. <laughs> and that was very sad. That was a very sad day. Okay, this is good. Uh, oh, the wording on my right on. That's right. You guys can see that sometimes. 
That's the wording on my right arm, memento mori. And then on the inside, that script right there says saper ad, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it's Latin, and it's the Whittington family crest, uh, and it means dare to know, of all things. Seems fitting. Stephen Elston, fellow bald bearded music professional. Hey, welcome. There's a lot of us. Yeah, and our leader is Tony Levin. <laughs> Although he's mustachioed, he's not bearded. <laughs> uh, this is Japanese Yoichi single malt, no age statement. Bam Bam 2X, thank you. Cheers to you. Okay. Um, uh, any other questions? We're crawling in on eight, but I'm going to let it go a little bit longer. What are your thoughts on Amberana barrels? I think, man, it's so easy to have opinion about things. Um, but what really, who cares <laughs> about people's opinions? I think it's a really interesting impact. Uh, I think if you're not careful, it completely destroys the fundamental character of whatever you were using originally because it's such a heavy hand that you have to be really careful with it or it just dominates everything. And I think we're seeing a lot of it and some people understand that and some people don't. What new kid on the scotch block am I watching? Lock Leah, where um, John Campbell went from Lefroig to become the head honcho at Lock Leah in the Lowlands in Scotland. And I have their first releases, like first release or first fall harvest or first harvest or something. And they're really cool and they're young, but I'm really excited to see where that goes. My favorite crowded barrel bottle is super selfish. It's the Jackalope. And it's because I worked so hard on that blend for so long. And I feel like I did the best I'm capable of doing. There might have been a better whiskey that existed from the barrels I was working with. As a matter of fact, there probably is. I'll bet Irene Tan would have uh, handed me my hat. Um, or Emma Crandall would have just kicked my ass in that blending. But that jackalope, I feel, is the high water mark for my abilities as a blender. And I'm really proud of it. So, so there. All right, let's talk about malt. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to have to get the Balconis out. Because why not? Oh, no, I'm starting to get nervous that I don't have one. That'd be really embarrassing, wouldn't it? I may not have one. <laughs> I mean, I have a malt. I tend to drink them really quickly. Um... I don't know what Jack distilling is. Paul Nimmons, what are your feelings about Jack distilling? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Jimmy Drammer. Oh, Hakushu is great. I'm a big fan. Uh, Lineage is my one of my favorite Balconas. This is, is. Okay. I don't like brimstone, Kevin Quill. I just don't. I, I endure brimstone sometimes to be polite <laughs> okay let's see what i got oh no this is gonna be risky because i've got a camera cable running across well here they are they're all down here okay i don't know what i'm about to pull but it's the easiest most accessible one Okay. Oh, and I need a glass. Let me get one more here. You guys know what the highest quality YouTube streaming is? Is uh, when you go off camera and roam around. That's that's when you know you're getting premium YouTube quality. Okay. So, uh, oh, Applejack. I don't like. I hate apple juice. I, I like apples. 
but I hate apple juice with a passion and I don't like cider. I'm weird like that. So I probably wouldn't like it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I like that I get to be in the old vault. Thank you. Me too. Uh, Emma's at Balconis. Um, this is the Balconis Distillery Single Barrel Collection. That is uh, bottled in 2020, used bourbon, 40, almost four years old. Ah. Oh, man, that was a drying out cork. I've been letting that sit in the back too long. But I'm excited about that. Oh, it smells so good. Um, oh, Eric Waite Whiskey Studies. Now that they're owned by Diageo, do you think they'll source casks from Scotland? Uh, maybe I think they're, they're still super getting to be super creative and they get to make all their own choices about that kind of thing. But I think they're more interested in sourcing casks where Scotland is getting them from than they are than getting them from Scotland. Justin one, I do not apologize. <laughs> okay. Oh, Gwen and friends. Hey, we were just chatting. It's good to see your face in here. Uh, what's your Japanese bottle white whale? Um, I don't know that I have one. And you can blame it on my inability to remember some of the ones that were truly important. Um, but I do miss the age statement Nika brand releases. So those maybe? Maybe those? Okay. What do we got? Oh, super fruity. This is like overly sauteed, like, what do you call it? Poached uh, apricot candle wax. <laughs> Just a fruit explosion. It's almost funky. I love this. This is beautiful. Mm. Okay. Ah, that's good. Okay, what are we wrapping up with? I'm going to give it 10 more minutes. Thank you for following me to the new world when the first one crashed. This is what happens when you do it all by yourself in your living room. And yes, this is, I'm at home. I was going to do it on campus, but my internet is actually better at my house than the internet on campus. And so I thought it'd be safer. <gasps> Lost Lantern. Uh, I haven't looked at the Midwest collection because I was worried if I clicked on the link, I would buy everything. And I, I just, I've bought too many Lost Lanterns. I've got like 15 Lost Lantern bottles right now. And I don't need more whiskey in my collection. I need less whiskey in my collection. So I know they released it and I've liked all the posts, but I haven't clicked through to see what they are because I'm worried that I lack self-control. <laughs> okay. Any yard bag? I have some here, but it, all I have is the tin back there. No, actually, I think it's the drum. Oh, hey, no. The yard bag drum is what's in my scotch uh, decanter. Yeah. What other whiskey channels do you watch on YouTube? I mean, honestly, not many. I'll, I'll peek in on people here and there, but not religiously. I love Chad and Sarah. I love all the ones that you guys, that our community has built. And I'll peek in on all of them. There's such a long list. Um, I like watching Eric Waite. Um, and uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't watch it like I should if I was really following along with everybody. I like Ralphie. I just sort of like, if I'm random scrolling, I follow all those people and subscribe to them. So as I'm rando scrolling, I'll periodically click and watch some clips from various people. But everyone does such a good job. Some of those videos are just beautiful. People are doing a great job on Whiskey YouTube these days. How many bottles do I drink a year? Uh, it would be under 10. Unless you count the reviews. It might be one a month if, if you count the reviews. But I actually don't finish most of the... If you look on the floor right now from the live stream, what you're going to see is six glasses that look like they're freshly poured. That's how little I drank out of them. Because uh, I want to survive in this industry. <laughs> uh, 
I don't want to have to, for my own health, have to leave the industry. Okay. I've not been to Japan. Oh, Cedar Ridge. Yes, Daniel Fronmelt. Cedar Ridge Quintessential is amazing. And it's a beautiful whiskey. And I think Cedar Ridge is doing amazing things. Cataleja is probably my favorite Balcones release in recent memory. Uh, when Lineage came out for the first time, it blew my mind. I, that was, it blew every other Balcones I'd ever had out of the water. And then Cataleja happened and it did the same thing. Um, yes, we're working on the idea for Whiskey Vault merch. Uh, we just finished the prototype merch store for Wizard Academy in Chapel Dulcinea today. Jessica was working on it and getting it wrapped up. I and mean, that's not finished, but like we're in the final stages. And so as soon as that's working and we have it all the kinks worked out, then yes, absolutely. We'll start doing some Whiskey Vault merch. All right. Oh, yeah. Justin Juan, Super Chats is when you... Um, people can donate money, right? During the live stream. I specifically unclicked that button because in order to click it, I would have also been required to allow YouTube to run ads. And I didn't want to do bother with that. I didn't want any interruption. And it turns out we already got an interruption with my lack of tech skills. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Far North Distillery. Those people are good. Those people are cool people. Hmm. Let's see what else is in the comments. I have a comment for you. Hmm. Oh, I've got one. I've got a good way to, to go out. I want you to go out by trying something you haven't tried yet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Try it live. Okay. So is that a fresh glass? It is. Thank you. So Mark brought over... Um, the Leopold Brothers, the new three chamber release. I have the one um, that Todd gave us when he came to the Bastards Ball. That was the very, very, very first one. This is the next one, I guess. Six years. Six years old. The first one he had was two. I think. Yeah, it was. Wow, six years, batch forty-five. I'm not going to tell you a lot about three chamber still because. I've sat and listened to Todd speak about it for hours and I've hung out with my friend Reed and he's tried to explain it to me and I think I get it, but I do absolutely do not get it to the level where I can teach it to you. <laughs> but my first analysis on the first one was they managed to somehow keep the funky, fainty, tailsy notes in the rye without getting the wet dog, wet cardboard paper shitty notes from the tails. And that was the impact that I got. Super weighty, heavy, low tailsy, but none of the weird off notes of the tails, but all of the impact and the weight. Oh, and I, again, that's exactly what I'm smelling too. Okay. Someone asked a great question about EWA, and I am Axel Canons. I'm going to answer that, I promise. Um, okay. Rich, kind of phenolic, very fruit forward for a rye. Like it's less herbal and more, I mean, it is herbal, but it's, it's got more fruit in there than I would have thought for a rye. But man, does it have those low rangy or weighty notes, even in the nose. I like it. Mmm. Oh, man. That's way better. It's sweeter. It's way sweeter than it was before. It's bottle and bond, so 100 proof. Mm -hmm. I think a little touch of water, a tiny bit of ice. Yeah, it comes it's alive. Really, really be, be cool. Um, it's, uh, I'm just going to do some drops here. Um, so, uh, this rye is really great. Todd's doing a great job. Of course he is. It's not surprising in any at all. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I can't. Um, 
uh, after I had to restart the live stream, my camera defaulted to the original color tone, and I just looked like ripe red beet red drinking, Daniel. But I looked like this when we started it. So I I should have <laughs> fixed the camera. I look like something sunburned right now. Um, I love this. This is good. This is fun. Okay. EWA. The question was asked. Edinburgh Whiskey Academy uh, is doing a great job of certifications and fully backed by the Scottish government. Their programs are really information heavy if you do most of them. And then the further you go along, the more they start diving into sensory and palate training. But if you tiptoe in, you get like really in-depth info. And, and, uh, and then if you get a little further, you get even more nerdy info, but also a lot more uh, sensory development. I love their program and I, I love them as people. I can't be objective about them because I work with them directly. So I'm a huge fan of them as an organization and as people. Um, and I like their programs for, for what they want to accomplish. They are hitting it right out of the park. Yeah. Yeah, Logan Sicily. Yeah, sorry. When you don't have a dropper, you use your fingers to add water. Um, okay. How many glasses per night means responsibly drinking? Man, that is up to you. But I would argue, I ch forget the glasses because whiskey has different proofs. I try to stay under 0 0.06 or 0 0.05. Um, like when I'm really like cutting loose and like, wow, all right. And that's not even, that's barely halfway to the legal limit in the United States for driving and drinking. But if you've ever had a 0.08 blood alcohol level, you can't believe that that's the legal limit because you do not feel okay at 0.08. Um, so I think a drink two drinks in an hour Cut that shit off. Wait an hour or two before you go back. And this is why if you find yourself in professional whiskey circles, everybody does a lot of small pours. That's the habit. You don't find whisk professional whiskey tables and you'll see like 20 bottles on a table and you'll see everyone's glass looking like this. Because that's how you survive in the whiskey industry. Um, man, Captain Willoughby, let's make it a, we a weekly live stream. Sweet Jesus, man. That would be exhausting. <laughs> I do want to do this more. I do think we could do a once a month or something, but right now this is the only way I feel that I can actually like talk to you guys directly. Um, oh yeah. And by the way, Edinburgh Whiskey Academy is launching an American single malt certification. I helped shoot videos for it. So if they use my videos, which they don't have to, <laughs> they can change plans, uh, then you're going to actually learn partially from me. But they did a great job of roping in other American distillers, and they are tied into the American Single Malt Commission, and they're doing a really good job of it. Um, and then there's a, do you like Jack Daniels? I do, but I actually, um, only the single barrels, typically. Okay, let's see. Uh, it's almost 8.15. Let's wrap this up. Is there any other random question? Vic is amazing. Yes. He's one of the instructors for the Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. Oh, we need a toast. We'll do the Irish toast. How's that? Uh, well, my middle name is Daniel. <laughs> and when this ends, I'm going to go sit on the back deck and hang out with my friend Mark and smoke a cigar. Um, so I appreciate you guys. And we will figure out doing this more frequently. And thank you for joining me. So here's to those who love us. May they love us. And to those who hate us, may God turn their hearts. And if you cannot turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we may know them by their limping. Cheers. <laughs>